Well, hey there, church. Thank you for joining us as we pick up with our Wednesday study in Jeremiah. Obviously, last week we covered Jeremiah 3, 1 through 5. Uh, that week, or this week, that leaves us Jeremiah 3, 6 through about uh, through 4, verse 4. Uh, that's sort of the next big run, and that's a lot. And so this week, we're going to bounce around a little bit in there. We won't necessarily do it verse by verse like we normally would. We're going to cover the main thoughts there and sort of what we take away from that in our lives today. And obviously a lot going on in the world still. Uh, big news in the state of Texas yesterday as Governor Abbott has decided to lift the mask mandate and allow businesses to open to 100% uh, as of the 10th of March. And he's still giving leeway there, allowing businesses to sort of set their own standards as far as that. But the state is not going to step in with any mandates as far as that goes. Uh, what does that mean for us as a church? Well, I'm going to uh, talk with some of the deacon leadership this week, and we're going to come up with an idea of what we feel like is best for the church going forward, and then we will pass that word along. Obviously, we're going to do you know we're going to take that everything into consideration and, and make the best decision possible, not only to get back to business as usual. Uh, but to keep everybody safe and to prevent any sort of uptick in virus cases as best we can. And so we encourage, uh, covet your prayer in this time and, and hope that we make a decision that uh, goes well, not only for the church, but for us as a people group as well. So with that in mind, let us look here at Jeremiah chapter 3 uh, to about Jeremiah 4.4. 4. And obviously I said we're not going to cover every single verse in there. I encourage you, if you want, go and read the whole thing. Uh, it's great scripture, and we think about what's going on here, and just and sort of a go back to where we were. God is sort of laying out his charges against Israel, and he's hurt. You know, we've talked about this before. The emotion you can hear in this is God is, you know, it's that parental sort of, I'm not mad, I'm disappointed. You know, and he's definitely mad, but he's, I think he's more disappointed. He's more hurt by what Israel's done, and he's just sort of airing it out for them. And he's continuing that, starting at verse 6, where he's, He's basically laying out how Israel was unfaithful. You know, he's used the adultery analogy a lot. He continues that in verse 6 to about uh, verse 10. And uh, what gets me is when we look at verse 12, and that's where I'll pick up. It says, Go proclaim this message toward the north. Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will frown on you no longer, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry forever. Only acknowledge your guilt. You have rebelled against your Lord, rebelled against your God. You have scattered your favors to foreign gods under every spreading tree and have not obeyed me, declares the Lord. Return faithless people, declares the Lord, for I am your husband, and I choose you. One from a town, two from a clan, bring you to Zion. Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. You know, this was what God did for Israel in the beginning, and at the same time it's what he's saying could happen for Israel again if Israel would just admit guilt. And I think for any of us today, it's that. That's the thing we struggle with more than anything else as a people group. I think we, we struggle with acknowledging guilt. Right? We like to talk about it. We like to say, oh, yeah, we should, own, you know, we should own it. If we do something wrong, we should own it. We should be people that own our faults and, and stand up and admit and do this and do that. But it, when it push comes to shove, we struggle with it, church. We struggle as a people group with admitting when we were wrong and accepting the consequence of that, consequences that come from that. It's part of our sinful nature. It's part of the shame that comes from the fact that we know better, yet we continue to do the wrong thing. And I think for us today, church, we really need to look at that. We need to look at the idea of knowing when we've done something wrong and owning it. And not only asking for forgiveness from the person, but asking for forgiveness from God. Because I think that was Israel's biggest problem here, was once they let themselves begin to creep down that path of doing things that were not of God, it just got easier and easier. 
because they weren't looking to God for the guidance they needed. And so doing these things that were wrong just felt okay. And temporarily, they provided a benefit and a gain. But when they weren't admitting their sinfulness to God, it became easier and easier and easier until we see this point where God says he can't let it happen anymore. And Israel got so far down the road, they couldn't see the right from wrong anymore. And they broke God's heart. I think for us today as a people group, it's a similar situation. We have to be careful that we fall into this trap that we take advantage of God's grace. Yes, it's an advantage to us, but it does not give us an excuse to do or say whatever we want. I think it's easy for us to justify whatever we think is right because we try to tell ourselves, oh, it's what God would want. And that's a dangerous game for us to play, church. We have to understand, God doesn't want us to be hateful. But at the same time, God does not want us to condone sin. We have to show people the love of Christ. We have to understand that we're all sinners. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. It is our job to show people that God offered himself for them anyway, just as he did for us. Well, how do we do that, church? Well, we as a people group, we can't give ourselves over to the things of the world. We as a, a group today, we as Christ followers today, we can't be about the things of the world. We can't be about that. We have to be about Jesus. We have to be about growing his kingdom, growing his name. What does that look like for us today? Well, church, I think that's a personal question. Maybe it looks like loving on your neighbor, offering help. Maybe it looks like praying for those that you struggle with. Maybe it looks like just being nicer to people in general, realizing that my eternity, your eternity, is with Jesus and if my eternity is in perfection with Jesus, I've got no reason to be angry on a daily basis. But I have every reason to show love and grace and mercy to everyone that I'd be around. As we look at this going forward, again, God, if we stop from where we left off before and go, God continues to go into what Israel is doing and declaring them unrighteous and you know, using the adultery analogies again. But I want us to jump all the way to chapter 4 and look at verses 1 through 4. And this is what it says. It says, if you, were, if you will return to me, O Israel, return to me, declares the Lord. If you put out your detestable idols out of my sight, no longer go astray. And if in a truthful, right, and just way, you swear as surely as the Lord lives, then the nations will be blessed by him, and in him they will glory. This is what the Lord said to the men of Judah and Jerusalem. Break up your unplowed grounds and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and circumcise your hearts. You men of Judah, you people of Jerusalem, or my wrath will break out and burn like fire because of the evil you have done. Burn with no one to quench it. God here again saying, if you would just turn and repent, then I'll turn and relent. But the people have made their choice. Right? We talked about this Sunday when we looked at Acts. It's, you know, committing to a bad plan just because you feel like you don't you know, you've gone too far down the road, right? Israel to this point, so far down the road, they feel like it's too far gone to give up now. And they're committing to a bad plan, uh, even though they know it's bad, even though they've been told it's bad, even though God's telling them it's bad, they're committing to a bad plan because they feel like they've put too much into it to let it fail. Right? In the American vernacular, it's called too big to fail. Church, we cannot be so far 
down the road that we think that not going back to God is the answer. That's always the answer. No matter how far down the road you get away from him, the, the parable of the prodigal son teaches us that even when he was a far way off, the father was waiting and saw him coming and ran to meet him. Right? When we look at that parable in correlation with this, it's not that God was waiting for the son to come all the way back and beg mercy. God was waiting for the son just to make that first beginnings of returning. And he was already forgiven. In the same way for us, church, when we find ourselves seeking after the world, maybe you're out there and you've never accepted Jesus. The first step is turning and admitting sinfulness and moving towards him. And he offers that forgiveness. But for those of us that are Christ followers, we find ourselves sort of delving off the path like the prodigal son doing what we want instead of what God called us to do. All he's waiting on is for us to make the turn. To begin working back towards him. And he rejoices in that. And he's forgiven us. So the challenge here is the same as it was to those that were there on Sunday. And it's the same for the rest of us as we go forward. We have to stop committing to bad plans that pull us farther away from God and commit to making the turn and seeking to be more like him. And I know I say that a lot, but I think it's worth repeating over and over and over again because we have to make the turn. We have to turn towards God. We have to make that choice every day. When we lay our head on the pillow and when our head pops off the pillow in the morning, we need to be choosing Jesus. Because this world is going to throw everything it can at us to turn our heads towards something else that it says is good, but the truth is, it'll leave us wanting. And church, if we're not careful, we're going to end up in the same position that Israel was in here. Looking for the next thing that we think is going to sustain us. Looking for the next thing that we think is going to make us feel good. The whole time, there's a holy God sitting there saying, I'm enough. Yet we would choose to seek the things that leave us wanting more. Like an addict. We want that temporary feeling of goodness that comes from the things of the world instead of that long-term sustained joy that comes from a relationship with Jesus. Because that long-term sustained joy does have its moments of struggle, does have its moments of weakness, does have its moments of correction. Right? That's the difference. The world wants to tell you, hey, doesn't matter what you think, doesn't matter what you feel, doesn't matter what you say, you're right. Where Jesus says, I am right. Where the world wants us to think and feel that everything, no matter what, is right based on what the person feels at the time. Church, that can't be true. It can't. Everyone cannot be right based on how they feel at the time. We can't. It, it just doesn't work. There has to be a moral center. There has to be one true right. And it has to be Jesus. This world just wants to make everybody feel good. And I'm not going to lie, church, on its face, that sounds really nice. It does. It sounds really nice for everybody to be happy feeling exactly how they want to feel and doing what they exactly want to do. But church, we know that is not sustainable long term. Everyone cannot be right. Everyone feeling how they want to feel based on their life and their actions that can't be right. It can't be right because we are sinful people. So what do we do? Well, we look to the one who lived a pure and holy life and sacrificed himself for us. We look to Jesus as the example. 
We look to the one who looked at the whole of humanity and said, they need a savior. I can do that. We have to measure ourselves against him. Because here's the thing about the world. It will tell you that whatever you think or feel right now is okay, but eventually it's going to move the line. It's going to move the finish line forward. And you'll never get there. But the thing about Jesus is we're told that the finish line is there. The finish line comes that when we pass away from this earthly existence, we cross that finish line into eternity with Jesus. The world wants you to think that that finish line is going to move a little farther every time. And, oh, you just got to keep trying. Oh, you just got to keep trying. And if you don't make it before you die, well, maybe the next generation will. They won't. The world will just keep moving the line until it gets what it wants, and that is to take over everything about you and keep you so twisted up that you seek out after things that you know are wrong. The thing about following Jesus is, church, I admit it's not easy. There's a struggle in there. And the world is going to fight against you every day. The thing about Jesus is he's consistent. He's exactly who he says he is. He doesn't move the finish line. He doesn't change the rules based on what he thinks is going on at the time because he is all-knowing. He doesn't have to change the rules because he already knows the rules. Because he created the rules. The other thing about Jesus is he tells us clearly that he loves us so much that he sacrificed himself for us. What's this world ever sacrificed for any of us? This world doesn't sacrifice for us. It demands that we sacrifice for it. Yet Jesus offered himself for us, even though we were undeserving. So church, it's time for us to stand up time for us to be more like Jesus and less like the world. And I know I say that a lot, but I'm going to keep repeating it. It is time for us to be more like Jesus and less like the world. It is time for you, it's time for me to measure our lives against him, to daily seek to be more like him, to love like him, to sacrifice like him, to offer ourselves over like him, to be like him, not like the world. With that in mind, let us pray. God, we just thank you for the day. Thank you for the opportunity to gather to study your word, albeit still differently via the internet. We just thank you for giving us the resources and the ability to continue. God, I pray that we would be more like you, less like the world, that we would seek your will, that we would conform ourselves to your thinking because you don't move the finish line like the world does, God. That we would strive to be more like you every day. It's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us as we continue our Jeremiah study. Remember, uh, if you're in the Lytle San Antonio area or traveling through, we'd love to have you join us in person Sunday at 11 a.m. Remember, we love you. Absolutely nothing you can do about that. And if you have any sort of need or something we could help you with, please reach out via these YouTube videos or our church's Facebook page. Let us know and we'll do what we can to try to help you out. Until we see you in person or see you here again on YouTube, stay safe and we hope to see you soon.